Hey everyone, it's me, Hawkeye G, and I'm back with another video guide, as per usual. Today's video is a starter guide for the Ghost of Pahwaks faction of the Lizardmen, and it's taking place on the Mortal Empires map. Uh, so the goal of this guide will be to kind of give you, well, it's a campaign starter guide, right? It'll give you some advice and some strategies on what to do in the early stages of this game and how to get this particular campaign to a point of success. Now, I've already talked at length about the faction bonuses, legendary lord, and unique mechanics of the Ghost of Pahwaksh in my faction introduction video, so if you're not familiar with those, please check that video out, because uh, I won't be talking as much about those things in this video. Uh, of course, we will touch on them when they're relevant. But the focus on this guide will be covering the key buildings and building considerations for this campaign, the key military units and possible army composition considerations for this campaign, uh, your local and short-term campaign map concerns and strategy for the campaign, and then the long-term strategy and overall possible campaign approaches. So, with those things in mind, let's jump into the guide and see how things play out. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is the key buildings and building considerations for this campaign. Um, when we're talking about the actual buildings for this campaign for the Lizardmen, I don't actually, there's there's not as, there's not really a lot to say about this particular aspect of the campaign, okay? Uh, there's plenty to say about the Sanctums and the Sanctum buildings, uh, but we'll look at that in just a, in a little bit. Um, basically what I want to touch on is how the, like in a standard Lizardmen campaign, at least for me, you pretty much, I pretty much start out with Saurus Warrior Spam, right? Um, it probably doesn't work, I know it doesn't work as good on higher difficulties, uh, but if you're playing on like normal or even hard battle difficulty, just spamming out a bunch of Saurus Warriors, it's expensive, but it allows you to overwhelm pretty much any opponent. In this campaign, obviously, however, with the bonuses that you get faction-wide, plus if you have a couple little bonuses from Oxyadl, um, I mean, obviously he doesn't, you know, well, he starts with a couple, right? And so, with those bonuses, with the Vanguard deployment and all that different kind of stuff, I do think you want to start with Skinks. Of course, what you're seeing here is a few turns in, I've, re I've moved this building. Um, but basically, in this campaign, I would advise starting with Skinks instead of starting with Saurus Warriors. Um, I know that's maybe more of an army composition thing, but the point is, like, this is the building you're going to want to focus on in the early game. Like, you, you want to make sure you have the Skinks building instead of trying to focus the Saurus building. Uh, that's really all there is. Besides that, keep in mind that each Lizardman research tree is tied to a building. Um, and because you have kind of a, you're starting in one of these limited provinces where you don't have a 10 slot, you know, you have a, or a, you have an 8 slot. And that means that you unlock the, the double slots later on. So finding a spot to kind of sneak in, like... I mean, you see I have trade resources here, and even at this stage of the campaign, it's not super worth it, right? Um, I should have income here. But it's also a good, like, when you have the opportunity to sneak in, like, a Star Chamber Weapon Crafters Commune, or especially the Scrying Pool, right? Because the Scrying Pool is what unlocks this top center one that locks you off from all research trees in the middle. So just keep that in mind, right? Because you're starting with this limited settlement, you want, you want to be willing to put a building in for just a short period of time in order to maybe recruit a skink priest, right? Or maybe to unlock a certain research, right? So those are the kind of things that you really need to keep in mind. Now, the other thing, and obviously this is going to be the more extensive part of the building considerations, is the Sanctum buildings, right? So I talked about this a little bit in my overview as well. You have the Vision building, it's there by default, it's locked in. Uh, and then you have like the operations and armory types of buildings. The first thing that I really want to say is that local armies is something you need to pay attention to in the description of the text here, right? Recruitment cost, casualty replenishment, vigor loss reduction for local armies. Now, when I first saw that, to me that said, oh, that means anywhere in this province, right? Anywhere in this province, I will get this benefit from the recruitment cost reduction for all armies, uh, for local armies, right? Because if I have a unit here, if I have an army here, the recruitment pool that we pull from, when you, when you look at this and it says local, that means any building, any military building in this province, okay? When it comes to these buildings, that is not the case. When this says local armies, that means only within the settlement boundaries of Nagarond, right? It does not mean in any any of the province. That's why some of these have the local and adjacent regions thing, right? And, and maybe to get a good idea of it, 
if you have like a vision stone, when you expand it, the visibility that it gives you, that'll kind of give you a better idea of what regions would be touched by something with the adjacency bonus. So, just for the sake of proving the point, I've set up a little demonstration here. You can see in the frozen city, I have this recruitment cost minus 50% for local armies building. Okay, I have an army here in Dargoth, right? It's in the same province as the frozen city. Okay, but if I go to recruit units here, you can see Asaurus Spears costs 760 gold for this army. Whereas for this army, they cost 360 gold, right? So the point of this again, just to demonstrate that when a sanctum building says local armies, it means only in that settlement region of control, not in the province, which is what I had originally assumed. So with that in mind, um, there's really not that many buildings that I actually recommend. Okay. In fact, I don't really like any of the armory buildings. I end up building some just to try them out, but like the problem here is like this building is local armies, right? All of this is really only going to help you for one or two fights. Like unless we're talking about a region that is going to get like steadily attacked and you're going to need a lot of reinforcements for, uh, maybe if you go the possible route that I'll describe later of setting up outposts instead of, you know, taking consolidated territory, I could see it being useful, but I just, I feel like this is so, like, you're going to invest a thousand gold isn't a lot, but just to get you a bonus for, what, one, maybe two fights? Like, if I fight somebody in this region, maybe if I sit here in ambush stance and use my own city as bait to draw people in, I'm not saying these aren't useful, and of course, the, a thousand gold isn't a lot of money to spend on something like this, uh, but it's just, it just has, like, such a limited scope in terms of value, right? Cost effective, maybe, but like, you also have a limited number of sanctums. Is that really what you want to be spending it on? I know that when you get these upgraded, it does give you an army ability that also works in adjacent regions. So far, I have not found those to be very powerful. Like this Japati Sanctum Bombardment, it, the, they're just not, they definitely, I don't think that that single army ability justifies this cost whatsoever. So that means we stick with these buildings. This one is pretty obvious. You put this building in the place that you're going to recruit armies. Um, it's It can be useful to have kind of on the front lines so you can build an army up and get them going quick. Um, as I showed you though, I have it in the frozen city so that I just, anytime I start a new army, cost me half the price to recruit new stuff, right? You also have the capstone. Uh, I talked about this in my introduction video as well. Hopefully if you've like explored at all on this campaign, you, you found this building and you know what it is. This basically sets up a second location for you to be able to teleport, which I mean, you can see I don't have it set up right now, um, but this and, and teleporting only works with Oxyadl, but this is an extremely useful building. It doesn't matter about the ward save for local armies. It matters because this is a great way to establish your front lines and allow Oxyadl to stay on the front lines while also allowing him to take care of whatever visions of the old one tasks crop up, right? Because when you do visions of the old ones, you have to jump away, sometimes to a far flung corner of the map, right? When you're done with that, if you don't have a capstone set up, your only choice is to go back to your capital and no matter what kind of territory you have, you're going to have to expand outward eventually. So the capstone allows you to kind of establish a new front line for your lord to come to. The other two buildings that I do tend to use are the replenishment and upkeep building. The upkeep one especially because the lowest level of it already has this all forces in adjacent regions, right? Upkeep reduction and income from post battle loot. It's not a ton, but just the fact that I only, it takes one turn to build this and all adjacent regions will get this bonus. Um, I think that this is really useful. This is probably the best one out of all these buildings, in my opinion, just because of that, right? When you're laying sanctums down across the map, like what, you know what I mean? Like I can't, I can't really stack the recruitment one back in my home territory. Like what am I going to do with a sanctum here? Maybe if I have enough surplus sanctums and nothing better to do with them, that's when you start putting sanctums in your front lines where you want to try to defend places and maybe put some of the armory buildings in there, right? Something I should consider for this province. But uh, yeah, besides that, you know, I um, 
I think that this is just this is a useful one, right? It's it's simple and it's easy to use, and you can you can just put it down and make use of it right away. The casualty replenishment one I think is is good too, but this one requires pre-planning, right? It's going to take you six turns at least to build up to this, where this one will actually give you the adjacent regions bonus. But it's a great tool to use, right? I mean, you can see that's what I'm going to set up for here in Nagarond, right? I've already established that place. I'm still kind of like recuperating here. I probably should have set it up or could have started working on it earlier on, though you can see I don't really have the money for it. Um, but basically you want to plan ahead with this building. You plant this in territory that you're going to move on in the near future so that when you do, you'll be able to get good casualty replenishment rates. The last building to talk about here is this patrols building and it sounds cool, but I just don't find it to be worth it. Again, I think one of the main drawbacks is in the local region, right? That building is only going to work on enemies that are in this particular settlement zone. And a 33% chance to ambush, like it sounds cool. And then it does kind of give you this extra army that you can basically just throw away and put attrition. Like, you know what I mean? You can win a war by attrition just by throwing away an army that you never needed in the first place. Um, but I just find it doesn't happen that often. I mean, a 1 in 3 chance of ambushing somebody, but only while they're in this little region. Like... So what happens if the AI just goes up through this way? Then they never get affected by it, right? So so basically, to summarize, um, I don't really like the armory buildings. I don't really use anything other than, like, like the upkeep and the casualty replenishment ones. I find these are the two most common ones that I use. Uh, the, the recruitment cost one is good, obviously, and I use it, but you don't... This isn't one you'd, like, deploy in a forward base, right? This is something that you use in like your controlled territory, not an enemy territory. And then the capstone, you can only have one of these. So you just kind of move that forward as necessary or to whatever location you want to have it in. So that should cover everything I wanted to talk about with the buildings. Uh, most of the focus here is on the Sanctum buildings, but if you weren't familiar with them or you haven't played around with it, or you just didn't know the bit about the local armies and it only affecting the settlement region, I hope that that helps you. We're then going to move on to the key military units and army composition considerations. So again, I, I mentioned this before, but here's where at least I deviate a little bit more than from a typical Lizardmen campaign. Uh, normally, Soros Warriors are your mainstay, unless you're playing something like maybe Cult of, Cult of Sohek, Sotek, or perhaps Talakwa. Uh, you, I typically just go Spearman Spam. It works against whoever, and then you kind of add in some niche units like flying units or cavalry on the side to turn the advantage in like the early to mid game. Uh, in this campaign, you want to go Skinks. Uh, you have all kinds of bonuses to them, right, which make them uh, not necessarily a better unit, but certainly more cost effective, right? I think that's the biggest component. I don't. I still don't know if I would say that skinks are better than Saurus warriors, and and they might appear to be on paper in some aspects once you get them to maximum experience rank or something like that. But the real the real benefit is the cost effectiveness, right? The reduced upkeep plus the increased the increased bonus to them. I think that that's useful. Um, if you've been watching other people's live streams, you've probably even seen people, even on Legendary Difficulty, go with a full stack of Chameleon Skinks, right? And, and I think that there's, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that that's a great strategy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when you're going the Skink route, you can still fill with Skink Cohort, right? The, the main reason why I think that this is a little bit more useful here, so you have that exper uh, the upkeep reduction, but you also have this quick learner, which means it'll rank up faster and get to take advantage of these bonuses more. So in order to really keep your cost down, you can add in some just some skink cohort for cannon fodder, basically. So with the new units that we have, uh, we have the Chameleon Stalkers, we have the Quaddle, and we have the Feral Troglodon. The first unit that I want to talk about here is the Chameleon Stalker, uh, and in a way, from what I've seen from some people who are using it, I think they're using it wrong, or at least are, are misinterpreting like how, how it's supposed to be used, or at least from what I've seen, how I think it should be used. So look at the stat line ones, right? We have high, high melee defense and low melee attack. This is a Spearman type unit, it's not a Swordsman type unit. That means that this is supposed to be a line holder, right? 
Uh, but at the same time, like it says in the description, it's shock infantry, right? You have a pretty decent charge bonus. You have good speed. And essentially, it, it's more of a cycle charger than it is a true line holder, right? Uh, but I think that that works fine for the Lizardmen style, especially with the type of missile units that you have, and in particular with Oxyodal leading the army. Um, basically, what happens is, well, I've got a demonstration set up here for you, so let's jump in and take a look at it. So, the way I usually see these fights play out, or at least the way that I've been playing them out and microing them in my campaigns, looks something like this. You sit on the front lines. Oop, you don't want your side units to get spotted, but... That'll happen sometimes. Uh, but so what you do is you've got this whole front line, right? That's here. That's got missile stuff. And as the enemy gets close, you start to kind of... Oh, oh, why did we lose selection of that? Start to back them off and you trade them in for your melee units, right? Uh, but again, you know, these aren't meant to be, you know, staying infantry. They're not, you know, they're not supposed to be treated like... Uh, so they're not they're not true spearmen, right? They have a similar to stat line to a spearman like unit, but that's not really what they are. And so what you end up doing is trying to trying to rotate your front lines back and forth, right? You, you essentially have like a line of of chameleon skinks on the front lines. You push you have them push forward and shoot at the enemy, and then you back them off so that your chameleon stalkers can get a nice little charge in and then you back off the chameleon stalkers if you look at the stats for a lot of the like melee infantry for the dark elves the skaven the beastmen your chameleon stalkers can outrun most of that so it does allow you the ability to kind of you know make the distance like even if you engage with them right you then retreat and then you re-engage and then you retreat and then you re-engage right and you you have the ability to do that because of your speed um, so that's really your advantage with an army with an army type like this. Again, um, if you've watched live streams, you've probably seen people go full chameleon skinks army. Uh, reality is that's probably even easier to micro than what I'm doing here. This is a lot of work, uh, but it's also fun. I don't know. I had fun playing this way in the campaign. Uh, feel free to make your own decision. Again, just trying to show a little bit of a taste of what it looks like. Uh, I, I think we're going to win this battle. I don't really care, though. We don't need to show it for the purposes of this guide. It's obviously not the best performance in a multiplayer setting, um, but you can see what I'm... I hope you can see what I'm trying to get at with the Chameleon Skinks and Stalkers. Obviously, it's been working well for me. This is on hard campaign difficulty, normal battle difficulty. It's what I usually play on because that's what's most fun for me. But don't forget that in this campaign, I'm also seeing a lot of benefit from these additional faction bonuses, right? The additional uh, rank bonuses to these units, which you don't see that reflected in multiplayer. Also, I couldn't fit this uh, Skink Oracle into the army. I tried to grab a Feral Troglodon, just didn't have the... Uh, the numbers to use it but anyway that's this you can see right here this is the strategy that's carried me all the way through turn 50 um, being able to ambush the enemy especially being able to ambush the enemy with an army like this can help you out a lot um, but really just the kind of like like I said the ebb and flow swapping out chameleon skinks for chameleon stalkers for chameleon skinks for chameleon stalkers just kind of that back and forth battles can get kind of sloppy and your chameleon stalkers definitely take a lot of damage um, but again, it's about cost efficiency, right? You can see I have some Saurus Warriors in this army. These cost three times as much as a Chameleon Stalker. So, yeah, these units don't perform at the utmost highest level, even in the campaign. Uh, but they're not meant to, because they're literally a third of the price of their alternative. But I've rambled about that enough. Let's move on to the next topic, because what do you do moving into the mid-game? Well, you can see I'm building the Saurus Warrior building. Uh, again, it's it's just like a standard for any Lizardmen campaign. These, these aren't a unit that fill a niche, right? These are the unit that provide you your, like, your baseline, your standard, and you use other units to fill in the niche around it. I also really wanted to get a Scar Veteran because Oxyodal does not hold up well in melee combat and having somebody to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy lords can be really nice. Uh, but I, I actually think, after playing to the point that I have, I, I'm a lot further, uh, if I, just for the sake of proving it, like, I'm, I'm doing fine in this campaign. This is just a little bit of a snapshot for me to work from for the guide. 
I went with the Saurus building, but I'd actually recommend the Pterodon hatchery, the flying units, right? Uh, it's for two main reasons, Pterodon riders and Ripperdactyl riders. I didn't actually play with the Quaddle. I think that it would provide you the perfect opportunity to play with the Quaddle. It's kind of a multi-purpose unit where it is, it does have like the strength and damage that it can be kind of an aggressive single, like, like monstrous unit flying monster type, right? But it also has these spells. I don't know if the cloaking ability is really all that useful because especially in Oxyodl's army, working with all those skinks, you're going to have that anyway. Uh, but the, the, so I brought up these units, okay? The reason that you transition into this as you're, like you start with your skinks, you supplement with flying units because the Pterodon Riders with Fire Leech Bolas, these are going to obliterate infantry. And if we're talking something like Black Arc Corsairs or even Dread Swords and Bleak Spears, um, the like shielded units are can be a problem for your Chameleon Stalkers if you can't tar pit them effectively. Uh, Black Arc Corsairs just straight up have a lot of armor. And Chameleon Skinks don't do that much armor piercing, even with the bonus from Oxyodl. But Pterodon Riders with, with uh, Fire Leech Bolas, man, these things do some pretty crazy damage. Like, that's great that you have all this armor, but we're still doing, like, 70 damage. What is that? 30, 40, 50, 55 damage per hit for base damage. Like, or well, for total damage combined, right? Black Arc Corsairs don't have enough armor to defend against this. So this is really good for anti-infantry because the Chameleon Skinks can still serve the purpose as anti-large, right? They do enough damage and they hit them with the poison to drop their stats as well. Then on top of that, into the, as you get like into mid game, you transition into Ripper Dactyl Riders because this is how you deal with the enemy backline. I don't think that cavalry is the answer because you're going up against a faction like the Dark Elves. They're going to have spears, they're going to have missile units, and they're going to have, like, I mean, they do have some flying units as well, but basically just the, like, the archers, right? Being Trying to fight archers and spearmen or navigate around them to hit artillery with your cavalry, not so easy. Going straight for the archers with a couple of ripper dactyl riders or going to the archers and then flying past them like disrupting the formation and then hitting the artillery with these I think that's the much better option again I I wish I had done that in my campaign, but that's why I'm advising for you to do it right So I think that these this is like step two of your military composition Because these fill in some of the weaknesses that an all skink army is gonna have that way you can keep the cost effectiveness of the skinks you can get these units, which obviously are going to be a bit more expensive, but they're going to they're going to fill that niche, the role that you're missing with these units. Um, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't go Saurus, and the Saurus warriors are still going to be competent fighters. Uh, you're going to be able to pair them and use the Skinks to fill your niche still pretty effectively. Um, so if you're more comfortable with that, you can still go for it, but. Uh, Especially if you're looking to spice things up in this campaign, that's what I'd recommend you do next, is going to the Pterodon Riders. Now, the last unit that you have that's new is the Troglodon. Um, this thing is basically a Carnosaur that has a, a pretty powerful missile attack. But one key difference is it is actually missing the Frenzy ability, which means that the, the Troglodon, while it has very similar stats you know, on the card... It's actually going to do less damage in melee as long as its leadership is okay. Uh, well, as long as the Carnosaur maintains leadership because of these bonuses, right? So the Carnosaur is technically going to give, be better, and the Carnosaur has the anti-large as well. Uh, but overall, it's a similar unit. Now, of course, you're playing the Lizardmen. Like, this this tree is the Great Beast building is inevitable, right? You sh should pretty much do this on any, any campaign. Um... I don't know when you wouldn't, why you wouldn't do this for the late game eventually. Um, but I, I would kind of advise against it in the early game. Again, we just talked about if you're fighting the Dark Elves, really the Dark Elves or the Skaven, um, even the Norska. I mean, the Norska you might do okay against, but like a Feral Stegodon and Feral Bastilodon, that kind of stuff is just going to be easy targets for going up against the armies like the Dark Elves or even the Skaven with heavy amounts of like missile units, right? And and like spearmen type, like anti-large units. Whereas your flying units are gonna be able to exploit that pretty heavily. However, into the late game, you're gonna want to replace your chameleon stalkers with something. You may even want to replace some of your skinks with something. And, and that something is, is in here, right? Like getting stegodons to be able to tank. Uh, by the point that you can get to these, 
you're going to be able to use them effectively and you you shouldn't be too concerned about uh like archers and spearmen because you'll have stegodons and hopefully flying units like these and perhaps still some skinks you also then will have the ability to put stuff like carnosaurs and troglodons into your army to be able to take a more aggressive posture do some good tar pitting to group things up for either your chameleon skinks or your fire leech bolas and use your pterodon riders to disrupt the enemy formations so that's the kind of thing that i that's that's the progression that i think that you should take in this campaign right early game is chameleon skink and chameleon stalker spam if you don't like the chameleon stalker you feel like that's going to be too much micro spam chameleon skinks man line them up back them up bit by bit by bit you just win every fight with minimal effort right uh step two you know going into mid game I definitely think you should go flying units, but combining flying units and skinks can be a little bit of a, you know, your weakness is that your army is going to be very squishy. If you would rather add in Saurus and do Saurus and flying units if you can squeeze it, or just doing Saurus and skinks, I think that's fine. You could do beasts as well, but I don't know if I'd recommend it at that point. These units just aren't going to do the job properly that you need them to. Um, but yeah, then moving into the late game, you're going to be reducing your skink numbers. Your flying units are still going to be useful. Your beast units, like this tree, is definitely recommended. Um, again, I left out the cavalry. I just don't think that these are going to, like, if you were fighting a lot of Skaven, I think these would be good, but you're not fighting a lot of Skaven. They could be useful, perhaps, against the Norska, but I don't think they're going to be as useful against the Dark Elves, and so I, I don't know if I'd really go... Like, Cold Ones is... The cavalry for the Lizardmen is a niche unit, right? It's it's fulfilling a specific role in a sp specific circumstance. I don't think you need to do that with them in this campaign. I also didn't really touch on the Cult of Sotek building, and that's pretty much just because, like, this, none of these units are going to really get any bonuses from your faction or from your leader, and these units aren't really going to complement what you have, right? You don't want, like, Chameleon Skinks and Razordon Hunting Packs, like, that. that's just kind of like a weird matchup. Ancient Salamander could be cool, but you could be getting Stegodons at the same time, and this is going to be a better complement to your army. I could see an argument for getting some Dread Saurians into the mix so that you can use those as tanking units. I just said you need those, right? But even in campaign, I don't know if I really find, you know, Saurians useful. It's still only one unit, and unless you have a ton of these, you're not going to be able to tar pit the entire map with it. So those are basically my thoughts on the army composition for this campaign and what I think is effective, what at least has worked for me thus far into the campaign. With that being said, the next thing to talk about is the more immediate campaign map concerns and strategy from the early game, and then we'll see how it transitions into the late game as well. So, I've jumped back a little bit here to kind of give more of a, a good look at the early game, give you an idea of what's going on, right? Uh, the very beginning of this campaign is pretty straightforward, right? You start at war with this Norskin faction, they have each of these three settlements, right? And so you have to fight them, and then the next like logical thing is to just fight these Norska to the east if you're depending on how well you do or how poorly you do there's a really good chance that this Norskin faction will invite them to go to war with you anyway so you might not really have a choice the the biggest issue that you'll face in like the first 10 turns is that this province is so divided right you're going to be led to attack the Norska over here in the west right they're standing somewhere right around here uh, so you want to go here and attack them and perhaps take Dargoth, but then you have to try to find a way to either take, like, you have to try to protect your capital while also taking this city down in the corner. It can be difficult, but it's a good learning experience because that's a time to learn to use your teleportation mechanic, right? Remember that I could be here in Dargoth at the start of my turn. I could teleport to the frozen city and then walk over here and attack. I, I don't think you can reach Shagrath from there, but I could at least like plant an ambush or teleport here and attack an assembled army that's halfway to my city, right? So just something to keep in mind, right? The, the What you want to do early on is get Oxyodl's army to full fighting strength and maintain that while still continuing to build new things uh, every opportunity you get. Right? Part of the part of the problem here is you have these two settlements that have ports in them, and so they give they give growth and income. So you can say, well, I don't need the growth building then. 
Um, but it's not as good as getting the growth building. You can say, well, I don't need income then, but it's not as good as the income building. And so it, it's kind of a tough decision to make. Uh, you have to try to balance it basically between actually taking like growth and income buildings directly to make sure that you develop at the speed that you need to, while also perhaps leaving some room for some of the more obscure tier three lizardmen building that accompany themselves with research that you might want to either place temporarily to get the research or keep in there permanently for some of the bon benefits that they have, right? The other main concern in the early game is the missions that you get from the Sanctum, and, and this is or for uh, the visions of the old ones, and this is why you want to make sure that Oxyadal's army gets to full strength and that you kind of update and refresh it as you go, right? Uh, they're a great source of things like Sanctum gems. They're a very good source of money. They can also get you some useful buffs, uh, some of the buffs are either not useful or they're just poorly timed so that you can't get use out of them, right? And that that's honestly what I would say is the key to the early game for this campaign, right? It's not really about how fast do you expand, how quickly and effectively do you take over your neighbors. It, it definitely helps to keep the momentum in your favor on that front, but you have to, the most important thing is to properly balance yourself between the missions that you'll get as you go and expanding your own territory, right? Obviously the first mission is just to conquer this Norska faction, but as soon as you do, you start getting new missions and you're gonna want, you're probably gonna want to teleport and take care of those. A lot of times it can be something like minus five public order faction wide. It can be stuff like plus five chaos corruption faction wide. There's also things like buffing enemy armies, but I won't get too much into that. They're, the missions can be so varied uh, that it, I don't really want to try to give specific examples. You'll see for yourself, right? The other thing I want to say that is a decision I think you should make fairly early on and stick to is uh, whether to play like standard Lizardmen or whether to play more like a Wood Elf style by building outposts, right? With the ability to teleport both to your home and to set up a capstone, you can use Oxyadal to set up garrisons at various areas of the world. So let's say one of your early missions has you go and attack the vampires, right? And wherever they happen to be, you attack them, you get a pretty decisive victory, and you can take over a couple of their territories. You might want to place a sanctum there and place the capstone there. This would allow you to build positive relations with Reichland and other Empire factions by going to war with their enemy. It means you could increase your trade agreements so that you could actually make use of the trade uh, resources, where as you saw on like, turn 50, I still didn't have that. Uh, it was a foolish decision, whatever, we all make mistakes. Um, it's the point of me learning these campaigns, but anyway. So let's say you teleport here and you take out the vampires, right? And you weaken them enough that you can take a couple settlements from them you might want to set up an outpost in there and, and well, set up a sanctum and set up a capstone in there. And you could turn this into like a secondary land holding for you. You can ally yourself with the empire, get some trade deals going with them and have a second, like when you're not trying to fight on your like front here in the north or if you don't want to fight here or if you're just being like playing defensively on this front, you can focus on pushing here and perhaps build a second army here to push out the Lizardmen, or not the Lizardmen, the Vampires, and, and perhaps take some valuable territory, right? The Frozen City, this is not like the King of Kings in terms of valuable territory, right? The, and especially like all of this, if we can get over to like Grand and Harganeth and stuff like that, we can start making some money. But we have to fight the Dark Elves, where like, there's just pockets of profitable zones all around. So it's something that I think you can consider as a strategy, playing a Wood Elves-esque outpost style, where if in the first like 50 turns, you'd get to teleport somewhere that you would like to, you think, hey, this would be a great like secondary location for me to hold. Um, that'd be, it, it's fun, right? That's not what I actually recommend doing if you're strictly looking for the best way to succeed in this campaign. That's not what I recommend, but it's fun and it's definitely an uh, it's a possible strategy, right? Uh, it the thing is that it has the same problem that that kind of gameplay has. You have to build more armies to spread to defend spread out territory than you would if you had to if it were all in one place, right? You do have Oxyado that can teleport, but nobody else can. 
So if I were to build an outpost down here, I'd probably need a like a half of an army or a full size army down here and a full size army here because Oxyadol is eventually going to have to do another set of three or four missions and he won't be able to defend every attack on both fronts. Um, so like I said, it, I think it's an option. It's a fun way to play. I don't think it's the optimal way. The, the one other reason why is you're playing the Lizardman, right? Which means that you have the Geomantic Web to think about. And if you have two outposts across the world, that is not going to be as effective for the Geomantic Web as three provinces all in a row would be, right? So just some things to think about. Like I said, ultimately, I think this means it's better to play standard. You're still going to be getting three to four visions every 10 to 15 turns, so you do have to consume your teleports. Like, you're already going to be busy enough teleporting away and dealing with those problems that it'll be hard to aggressively expand your territory. Um, but but that's okay, because the Lizardmen are a more defensive playstyle in the campaign, especially in the early game, so it allows you to strike that balance more easily. Uh, like I said, you have the... Um, you have the geomantic web to think about, so I think playing more standard lizardmen strategy is better. Uh, you also have to be like very selective about what territory you take if you're going to take an outpost and try to defend it, right? You'd have to globally recruit for your armies because no, only Oxyadol's army can teleport. None of your other armies would be able to. Um, it's kind of fun to set up an outpost in Norska so I can like teleport over there or like a Sanctum and a Capstone, teleport over there, wreak some havoc, and teleport out. Um, but is it is it effective for, like, long-term campaign consolidation? Nah, not necessarily, right? Uh, yeah, the, the real question is whether it will actually, out, if you're going to, like, take bases, are they going to output as much money as they consume for upkeep for the army that protects them? So I do think that's that's kind of a early decision you should make, which way sounds more fun to you to play. Um... But I, I think that that's almost, that's kind of leading into the long-term and strategy campaign approach, right? Um, so the next thing to talk about is what you're going to focus on going forward. We've already talked about whether to free roam or, or standard style. Uh, and if you're going to stick with my recommendation to play more standard, here's what's next. The Dark Elves, right? And I say long-term strategy versus early game you're going to be attacking the dark elves in the early game um this is a decision you're going to have to kind of make but so it, like i said the the long-term strategy is more about uh which play style you want to go with right so like i said realistically attacking the dark elves is something that will that you should and will do um in tech what i'd consider still the early game um, but that is going to be your long-term campaign strategy right they're they're close to you it's likely that either they or the Skaven down here, Clan Rictus, are going to become aggressors towards you anyhow. So if you're going to be fighting them, you might as well be gaining something from them. Uh, the game tries to point you in the direction of fighting Norska. That's what they try to set you up for. But like, it's just just like in Rakarth's campaign, it's a trap. This territory still sucks. You only get six build slots on one of these places, and they have local populace of chaos. So trying to take this like just the fact that you have suitable climate here is not enough to justify wanting to capture uh, Norska territory right so that's that's just something to keep in mind um fighting the dark elves you're probably going to fight them at like a strength disadvantage that's why oxyadol has master ambusher that's why he has the ability to teleport back to here that's why you have the ability to set up sanctums to give you reduced upkeep and casualty replenishment so that you can you can fight a little more effectively, right? Um, I've talked about the military composition already, but basically if you can get flying units into the mix, even if you can get the Pterodon Riders, those are going to help you turn the tides against the Dark Elves immensely, right? That'll... That will basically be the unit that solves a lot of your problems with, like, in addition to your skink army, right? Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's like, and like I said, this is kind of your long-term campaign strategy, right? Fighting the Dark Elves is a task. They're going to be strong. They're going to grow very large very early on. And it's going to take you a while, right? This isn't something that's going to last the first 50 turns. It's going to go well beyond that. Quite frankly... What you should expect is by the time you're wrapping things up with the Dark Elves and, and still like fighting off the fringes of the, the Skaven, 
you're going to be at or very near the chaos invasion. And because you've taken the dark elf lands, you need to prepare to deal with the brunt of the chaos invasion, right? It's going to happen to you as long as you, I hope you've been following all your missions up to that point, because otherwise the chaos invasion is going to happen earlier and potentially have some bonuses or cause some other problems. But that's, that's kind of why I advocate for the more standard approach to this campaign. I know it's not as exciting with this new mechanic, but if, you if you're like really thirsty for victory and not for fun, you play this like a standard Lizardman campaign. You build up, play defensively, get the geomantic web built up, and use the teleports to kind of like teleports and ambushes to gain an advantage over an enemy that might otherwise be stronger than you, right? Uh, the reality is that the one advantage that the like outpost strategy has is if I focus on just kind of defending a small amount of territory and have like an outpost set up somewhere else that I push out for, if I can bide my time until the Chaos Invasion shows up, then they're going to actually hit, hit the Dark Elves pretty hard, and that will give me an opportunity to move in. But, the, you know, it's just something to consider. So, once you have kind of reached that point where you've dealt with the Dark Elves, you've pushed them out, you've got the Skaven on the run, or at least on the ropes, uh, you're ready to kind of bunker down for a bit, start building up to defend against the Chaos Invasion. Hopefully by, by this point in time, you've discovered enough other races that you can establish trade relations with. I really still need to go and seek out the Lizardmen, like some of the, the primary factions, and set up some agreements with them. Would be great to confederate them. I just haven't dedicated the time to do that. Um, but yeah, other than that, like once you get this far, you hold your ground, fight the chaos, and keep taking out the visions of the Old Ones missions, and that will get you to the end of the campaign before too long. Uh, so with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope that you learned some valuable things about how to play with the Ghosts of Pahwash faction, um, the kind of different play styles you can have, what military units I think are useful, and what some early game and late game strategies are that you can follow to try and achieve success in this campaign. If you like the video, please subscribe to my channel. Please leave a like. I would love to hear your comments in the comment section below. Let me know what did or didn't work for you on this campaign. If there's some units you think I overlooked or some strategies that I should be taking advantage of, uh, maybe some other advice about how to use the Sanctum buildings because for the most part, I just use them to get vision on everything. Um, and I've already talked about the Sanctum visions at, uh, buildings at length. But anyway, yeah, thanks for watching. Have a great day and we'll see you on the next one.